Okay, is it is everyone back? More or less. Um so I want to um I want to look at some different films. Um now so there's I'm for for, for reasons of, of clarity I would say that there are two different impulses within Orientalism. This is this is simplifying quite a lot. There's an impulse that Said wrote about, which was essentially or often took the form of the reductive representation of Arabs. Hello. Um, and he connected that to larger, larger political issues. You can connect it to the Gulf War of the 1990s or the other Gulf War of later on. And, you know, and so they be, they, these, these become problematic, um, negatively inflected representations. Um, you'll find a lot of, of good stuff. If you just Google like Hollywood racism, Hollywood Orientalism, Holly, you'll, fi you'll, find, you'll find some really interesting studies of that. So this is the, you know, it's often condensed in the action films. You've got someone like Chuck Norris with like machine guns and often someone's like riding a motorbike with machine guns on it, just like shooting hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people either wearing turbans or, or, or faceless soldiers. And it's just that Hollywood um, reduction of the other to a, a negative caricature. There are other forms of, of Orientalism which are more hybrid and can you can put them in a historical context and they're more ambiguous you can't you can't call them bad or, and they're definitely not racist so you see that played out in there's lots of films there's a, there's a, a sort of a five yearish period from about 1999 through about 2004 where you see an awful lot changing in Hollywood lots of different on lots of different tracks on lots of different um Styles, some really mainstream, some more niche, some Chinese films coming through as transnational films. The first one that I wanted to look at is um, Ghost Dog, The Way of the Samurai. So this is a 1999 film, Jim Jarmusch film, so it's low budget, it's closer to an arty sort of film. Music by former members of the Wu-Tang Clan, set in America. Forrest Whitaker plays Ghost Dog. Um, let's just just see what we can get from the trailer. If you haven't seen it, it's, it's worth a watch. The soundtrack is worth listening to. It's all about the soundtrack. This one, but anyway, oh, music. Head, would it be cut off? He should still be able to perform one more action with certainty. You only comes like a revengeful ghost and shows great determination. Though his head is cut off, he should not die. I love and hate this film. The soundtrack is magnificent. Like it shivers down your spine. It's so painfully cool and gorgeous. The the concept behind it is brilliant. The the issues that it raises are magnificent. But as a film, I'm like, yeah, it's a bit boring. But um, so Forrest Whitaker 
ghost dog thinks he's a thinks he's a samurai thinks he's an assassin thinks that um, he's, he's someone who's going to look after a mafia guy who once saved his life right? it's really kind of clever and it's kind of flashbacks to that and did he really save his life or whatever so it's a bit mad and it's really cool and there's lots of issues about what is culture anyway there's a brilliance and I've written I've written thousands of words about this film and so have other people some people film like proper film studies people regard it as like the best American samurai film it catches like and they all, they all hate Tarantino they all say Tarantino is rubbish Ghost Dog because it's got the uh, it's part of the kind of aesthetic or the feel of a samurai film certain types of film like I don't know like a Twilight Samurai or something where it's slow and it's it's expansive and it's 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 concerned about its environment so you can there's a lot that you can say about the film as a film it's also about sadness it's also about it's nostalgia you can say it's postmodern film all the gangsters all the all the Italian gangsters in it they're all old and decrepit and they've got no money but they're still gangsters right and Ghost Dog's alone and he's a fantasist but he's also he is actually really a brilliant assassin and stuff there's a scene in it where he's driving along and there's two rednecks like yeehaw and that type of redneck um, like chewing tobacco and all that so proper redneck shit going on and they've just killed a bear and it's, it's really cold and he stops and he goes it's not hunting season is it and, and it's really racially colded as well and, and, and Ghost Dog says you know in some cultures uh, in some ancient cultures in ancient cultures the bear is regarded as a symbol of, of something and they go this ain't no ancient cult culture mister and he pulls out his gun and shoots them they go to shoot him and he just goes and shoots them and he says sometimes it is so you've got this really interesting thing about what is a cross cultural encounter going on like there's samurai stuff in it there's if you listen if you listen to the soundtrack and if you think about the Wu-Tang Clan who produced an album in about 1993 um, which was um, end of the Wu-Tang like um, 20 something chamber or 13th chamber some X number of chambers inspired by these films they have this hybrid music, quotes and samples and references to Hong Kong films and Japanese swordplay films. And the Wu-Tang Clan become a kind of subcultural hybrid grafting of these different cultural aesthetics into rap music. And the film's about that as well. It's about the grafting of different cultural elements. Like, so Soyal here was just saying how everything about the representation of Anna Mae Wong in that film was driving her nuts because it has Thai references, got some Indian references, it's got some sort of chinese sort of references, and it's just, it's just a mess. But maybe that's how culture happens. Culture's always a mistranslation. It's always a misapprehension of something. So there's, there's Orientalism in this film and in the Wu-Tang Clan because it's a, a, an interest in these aesthetics which themselves come from films and films themselves are already a kind of not an authentic representation of anything, are they? They're often ridiculous. So this is a different type, type of Orientalism here and it's just like one of the threads that's stitched through a, a tapestry and that's interesting. And this happens across uh, quite a number of films of this period. There are other periods we could have looked at different forms of Orientalism. Yeah. The one we've talked about but we haven't talked about is its aesthetics, its look and its feel is The Matrix. The Matrix was the, really the first time that a Hollywood uh, production said they're doing some really good stuff in Hong Kong. Should we just buy some of their talent. So they got Yuen Wu Ping over to choreograph it, who choreographed all of these other, these great martial arts films and all these, what we now call wire foo, you know, where they're flying through the air with swords. Like that. Um, and so we, and, and there was all the stunt people and all the technology came through from the, the Hong Kong context and people said oh it's thievery it's cultural appropriation it's terrible terrible crime but what it produced was a new kind of action aesthetic we've all seen the matrix right we don't really need to have this no, we don't. so 
It, what this film does, The Matrix, as well as being a sci-fi film, it, intra it introduces aspects of, of very popular genres in East Asia, like wuxia, the swordplay film, the flying through the air, what we now call waifu. And it prepared the ground for films like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. So I'm guessing most of us have seen it. I'm hoping most of us have seen Crouching Tiger. Crouching Tiger was the first... I mean, this is one of the first films that they talk about... Um, they use the word transnational about. It was, it was explicitly aimed at a global market. Like, global. Not just China, not just America, and perhaps somewhere else. We're going to get this everywhere. And arguably, this film was received well by audiences. Because we just finished watching The Matrix... So we were no longer freaked out in the West by people flying around with swords and stuff. We were like, because when you before this, before the Matrix and before Crouching Tiger, if you hadn't been forewarned and you were watching these in the West relatively obscure, uh, either Chinese Kung Fu, Hong Kong or Japanese films, you'd be like, what the, why are they flying? How, how does that, are they Superman? But now, Crouching Tiger has the ground prepared for it. In a land of eternal beauty and infinite mystery, a legend was born. So, you get, the, you get the impression, you get the picture. What can we say about this? One thing that we could say about this is that it, it reflects... So this isn't European or North American Orientalism. But film, this film and films like it or perhaps what you might call a move into self-orientalism or self-orientalization. Now, this is not to say that these um, these genres did not exist before as a cinematic thing, but it's to say that at a certain point, um, countries such as China and also Japan and other countries kind of go well if that's what the tourists want let's just go for it um, let's do this thing so a film like Hero in 2002 is, a, is essentially a kind of ultra nationalist um, film about China and the formation of China um, and it led not this this and other films led um, led certain cultural theorists. There's a guy called John Epigesi, or Epigesi, who wrote uh, an essay that I can't remember the name of. It's probably in your reading list. And he offered the term Kung Fu Diplomacy. Kung Fu Diplomacy. So, for those of you who... Uh, who whose favourite film was Forrest Gump? Um, the, you know, China, in the past, when it was a closed command culture where there was very little interaction with the outside world and it began to open its borders a little bit and open its doors to the west in the 70s and President Nixon went to China. It was all about the ping pong. It was all about table tennis. And that was a kind of, that was, there'd be tours and there'd be competitions. And then, so Jet Li actually performed. He was one of the, did a demonstration for President Nixon and young Jet Li did a performance of his Kung Fu and Nixon was like, wow, I like Kung Fu, it's great. Um, and it starts to be used as a form of cultural diplomacy. In these films, and in many films now, 
you can film in China. China, you know, until the 70s and 80s was very, very closed. You can film in China, and it seems to me, and this is simplifying a lot, that a producer will say, I want to film this, uh, this stuff in China, and it's almost like they'll go, will there be landscape? And you go, yes. Will you make China look beautiful? Yes. Will there be mountains? Yes. Will there be plinky plonky music and ah, oh, yes, right, you can do it then. Will you make it look like a tourist destination? Will people want to come here? Will you make China look spectacular? Yes, okay, make your film here. So films like this, Hero, the remake of The Karate Kid, if you think about that. I mean, it's all about the landscape. It's all about ultra exoticization, hyper, hyper orientalization. And so on. It's a good film. It's a big budget film. But it's a very, very ideological film. And you can definitely argue that there is something that we might want to call self orientalization taking place. Now, self orientalization, when we talk about Orientalism, we often think of it as, uh, say, a Western representation of a non-Western other, capital O, other. But it can also function as a deliberate strategy of producing, a, inventing a new sense of national culture. Right? Um, I'll try and talk more about this next week. We don't... So there's a book called The Invention of Tradition by... Uh, edited by two people called... Uh, I think somebody, Eric Hobsbawm and Terence Ranger... And they look at the way that power often appropriates traditions. Often European colonial power will appropriate certain traditions and use them to strengthen something, to strengthen something that they want. So the English, so I'm going to say the English, in India often appropriated and retooled Indian traditions. The English in Scotland appropriated certain traditions and structures in order to manage people better. Uh, we'll talk about that some more. And in, in China, the d definite kind of cultural diplomacy feature which celebrates now and really pushes Shaolin Kung Fu, Tai Chi, and a few other different bits and pieces um, for all sorts of economic and ideological reasons. I won't look at this trailer now. Um, the, the reading, one of the readings that I set for you is a reading that takes issue with um, Kill Bill, um, Bulletproof Monk, and um, The Last Samurai. So I want to get to that kind of stuff before we finish. What time is it? So the argument um, of the... So the guy's called Sean Tierney, and his essay is saying, if you look around this time, 2000-ish, 2002, 2003, 2004, you see this little cluster of films which are all really orientalist and they're really bad and they're basically racist, in which you have a white hero appropriating East Asian cultural skill sets, cultural values, and dominating and saving. So, first one, Kill Bill. Have we seen Kill Bill? What? <laughs> I just assume people have seen Kill Bill. Like I guess the way you assume that you've read the Bible. I mean, I haven't read the Bible, but you just assume. But Kill Bill, let's have a, little, have a quick look at this then. I don't... I might turn the sound off. Oh, I'm excited. So Kill Bill, it's another... Yeah, turn the sound off. Oh, no, the sound is important. Not too long ago, I was quite a professional. My friends and I... We were the creme de la creme in an exclusive industry. And we all worked for this man, Bill. Then one day, I decided to leave, settle down, and start a new life. But when I tried to get out, they get me in. Don't you ever wake up? I 
guess they should have tried a little harder. I suppose it's a little late for an apology, huh? I suppose correctly. Now it's kill or be killed. You have every right to me. Get even? Even, Stephen? I would have to kill you. That would be square. And I choose kill. <laughs> That woman deserves her revenge. And we deserve to die. No kidding, I heard it was kind of hard. Silly Caucasian girl likes to play with samurai swords. Yeah. Oh, any more subordinates for me to kill? Hi. Do we like Kill Bill? I like Kill Bill. Um, I like Kill Bill because of its... I mean, this is... We can go post-modernism with this. Um, and we, we're going to talk about post-modernism in future weeks more. Because it's got all of these different textual features from different traditions and these different venerations, uh, different forms of, like, venerating different cinematic legacies and traditions, Japanese swordplay films and, uh, you know, wushu films and all the rest of it. Um, is it Orientalist? I mean, Tierney thinks that it's bad because a white hero defeats non-white, in this case, specifically Japanese. There's also Chinese stuff going on in this. Um, and therefore, it's that white saviour narrative or that white superior, that European superiority narrative. So we can discuss that. Is that a thing in the film? Let's bring that to the seminars because we're, we're running out of time. Um, the other film noted by Tierney is Bulletproof Monk, also 2003. Let's have a look at this one. Who's seen Bulletproof Monk? Yeah? Is it worth a watch? Yes, it's worth a watch. Right. He has no name. And he protects an ancient secret. The scroll must never fall into wrong hands. Now he has come to the strangest place on Earth. This is America. We don't have enlightenment here. We have strip clubs. Las Vegas and HBO. Got it? Nope. Fulfill the prophecy. We must learn the unity of opposites. Immobile and stationary. I have no idea what you just said. He must find the one to take his place. <laughs> what are you looking at? He's so damn beautiful. The one entrusted with the power must do anything to protect it. All you have to do is believe. Believe what? The laws of gravity don't exist? If you truly believe that they don't, then they don't believe. Show off. Thank you. This spring. Who the hell are you? You should be asking yourself who you are. Let the destiny end. We'll find the soil. It's a matter of time. They never came to stop until he can be. And another begins. Get you this moment. I can help. Okay, so Bulletproof Monk, as you can see, it's so closely related to The Matrix. Um, it's got actors in it from 
um, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. It's a hybrid film that's crossing over different cinematic traditions and, and borrowing set pieces from The Matrix and so on and so on. And it's very, um, it's very invested, again, in these East Asian martial arts aesthetics. The criticism of it that Tierney raises is that still the power dynamics, still the white male-female love interest, they're still the heroes. And that that is just re reproducing racialized structures of value, you know, white boy, white girl, mm, happy ever after, they've learned all these arts and everything, and that they've crossed these lines. And, th and his argument is that, like, it's, it, it's so many films. So the third one, the hat trick, the third one, this is the one that interests me the most out of these three films, is The Last Samurai. Who's seen The Last Samurai? It's a great film. It's got Tom Cruise in it. It's bound to be great, right? Action, grrr, manliness. So this one, let's have a look at the trailer. It, con it conveys quite a lot of stuff. It's quite, it's quite good. So, watch this one. So, I think that the the Last Samurai is more interesting. Again, Sean Tierney hates it, and and why? So, white guy, Japan, samurais. He dries out as soon as he's not an alcoholic anymore. Starts training, super tough, super skilled. Becomes the, as good a swordsman as someone who's been a swordsman all his life. Then, so he's living with the family of the man he killed in battle, and that man's widow falls for him and loves him and helps him to put on her dead husband's suit of armour, uh, and then 
he's the only one that survived the, the battle at the end. And who is this last samurai anyway? Is it Tom Cruise? Is it Captain Algren? So you've got this structure again. You've got the structure again. Not only is this guy a white saviour, but it's, it's just like, how? It's like, yeah, all right. So I've killed your husband. I'm going to move into your house. Do you love me? Do you really love me? It's really problematic. Really problematic. Same structure as kind of, um, you know, Miss Saigon. It's like it's the demented structure. It, it's just like, anyway. Anyway, um, so, T and E hates this. I think it's interesting because, for your purposes, it enables you to see some of the ways in which um, Orientalism is actually a kind of product of modernity, a product of a way of thinking. In the film we have a binary structure. We've got the West, which is the Wild West, or the formerly Wild West in America. Captain Algren was a soldier, vanquished, you know, killed lots of people and won lots of battles. But now he's washed out. He starts off, he's in a sideshow, he's an alcoholic, he's just performing for money, no values, no life. Goes to Japan to train them in modernity, which is guns, machine guns. At the end, you get a Gatling gun, rat -ta 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 -ta, like modernity, mechanised death, right? But he rejects all of that and turns to the history and values and meaning of the organic, ancient, oriental culture with its wisdom and its connection with nature and connection with higher virtues and so on. So it's a p perfect kind of um, dramatisation of an Orientalist structure. It's a, really, it's a really interesting film to think about and write about and work out the, 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 all, the, all the issues here. A lot of issues. I've, again, I've written a lot about this because I sort of quite like it in a, as an interesting puzzle. Like, is he a goody or is he really a baddie? There's more to it than that. But um, in terms of the kind of Orientalist status of it, this kind of structure continues. You know, you're still getting this stuff now. Films like The Great Wall. Have you seen The Great Wall? It's on Netflix. It's, I managed to watch about, I think, about 30 minutes of it before my body started to slowly die. Um, and I thought, I'm never getting this time back. Um, it's, it's essentially unwatchable, I think. But it's, 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 but he was Jason Bourne. I mean, how could he be in a bad film? Um, so Orientalism. What time is it? Nearly time. Damn. Okay. Um, is Orientalism... Was Orientalism ever a cultural problem, a cross-cultural problem? Does Orientalism, like, hurt us? Does it hurt specific groups? Does it hurt specific ethnic, national, or cultural groups? Um, I think that answer is not straightforward. For Edward Said and the type of things that he is talking about in the moment in time and his situation and investment in the kind of uh, Israeli-Palestine conflict and, and uh, disagreement and, and entrenched problems, yes, he regarded much of the Western media as very, very biased in favour of um, Israel and many of the representations in the news media and in the literature of Arabs, uh, Palestinians in particular, as completely negative. Um, but if we, if we expand the concept of Orientalism in different contexts, is it always a bad thing? Is Orientalism always a... does it have a victim? So I think sometimes you're, gonna you're not going to be able to have a blanket answer to everything here. And then, does Orientalism say, as a cultural interest at a certain time, interests, and, and European culture has had different interests uh, in, in, in foreign cultures for many centuries, really. The whole notion of like Shinwazari, you know, like Chineseiness, um, is, 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 is entrenched. It's, 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 it's a very, very long running thing. And does that emerge? That, as an interest, does, does that emerge as a kind of lack, a lack of something? You're in, is it a symptom of a problem that you have in this relationship, in this community that you are in now, that you invent 
a kind of other Eden somewhere else, a fantasy, abroad, or back in the past. So Orientalism, so Saeed also notes that Orientalism is not just about the far away and the exotic, it's also about the mists of time. And if you look at the visual semiotics in The Last Samurai, the first time you see the samurais turning up in the forest, they're literally running through the mists of time. The mist, they're coming through the forests. They've got their hats on. Like um, Darth Vader. Darth Vader's a samurai. Like, obviously, that's what Darth Vader is. Darth Vader's a samurai. And, you know, Luke Skywalker is a Jedi. And the Force is chi. Um, it's kind of a hippie film. Um, but a countercultural film. Which I didn't get a chance to talk about. So why am I talking? I don't know why I'm talking about it. No, the mists of time. That's what it is, the mists of time. A long time ago, in an exotic place, far, far away, samurais, Shaolin monks. Okay? But does Orientalism feed or fuel nativism? And nativism is that thing where you, you kind of associate, like, this land, this soil, has these people in it with this colour skin, this colour eyes, this colour hair, speaking this language. That's nativism. And, you know, nativism is a massive symptom. Uh, that's, a, that's the version of racism that we have in Britain, largely. It's that, what is Britain? Britain should be white, English-speaking, blah, blah, blah. That's British racism, in a nutshell. But you also get that. You get it in China. Han Chinese is like the dominant ethnicity of Chinese. There is, there is non-Han racism in China. And a sense that, you know, to be in China, you should be Chinese. Definitely Chinese. Han Chinese. Um, nativism. Does it fuel nativism? Different types of orientalism can. Is nativism always a problem? Hmm. Probably yes. My answer to that one is yes. Um, we have about t ten minutes less left. Why does Oriental? I think Orientalism does persist. You can see it everywhere. You can see it in lots of different things. Not always as a bad thing, often as a bad thing. Long tradition of genre, different genres and different media, different ways of representing different things. Um, do think that there is, it often emerges as a longing for an ancient or authentic tradition. Think, um, this is a different discussion, but when I was, I did, I wrote a book, which I'm going to tell you about in a second. I'll tell you about it now. So I wrote a book, right? Ah! I was going to give you a trigger warning. Um... <laughs> I was going to give you sick bags as well. I'm, I'm, we're not going to... Sh this is too... Oh, thank Christ. Even YouTube banned it, right? This is too offensive. It offends everything. Musically, culturally, ideologically, it's offensive. Um, so I wrote a book called The Invention of Martial Arts and I looked for... Um, I looked for different... Um, martial arts in different media contexts. And there's a chapter on music videos... I found that when you research um, the, the, the status of, of Asian martial arts, that's, that's any, that's Taekwondo, that's Japanese martial arts, so Korean, Taekwondo, Japanese, Filipino, Chinese, whatever, Asian martial arts, they, are re they have been hugely important in these poor, urban, often predominantly black communities in America as a source of values. The interviews with these artists, these performers, these rappers, so often they'll go, yeah, it's, it's, all, about the, it's all about the Kung Fu, it's all about the Karate, it's all about Jiu Jitsu. Because they're a source of values when, in, in, the, in these Western contexts of, like, say, urban decay or, or high unemployment, like, or, or family breakup and economic meltdown, like, where do you get your values? They have been a source of values. These, and there's Orientalism there and fantasies about the exotic other and so on. Nonetheless, sources of values. Um, so Orientalism pers persists in lots of ways and for lots of reasons. Um, and I don't think it is always a bad thing, especially when you're dealing with the, the way in which it is fed into different kinds of subcultural practices. But it can feed into racism. 
Um, so another thing that I um, where is that that one there? No, I want to. What I want to do is there. I'll do. So another thing that I wrote um, was an article about um, the representation of Chineseness in television adverts. And if you look at the history of British television adverts uh, and the representation of anything Chinese, there's Chinese food, you know, going on holiday in China. It's in, basically, it's just racist. Still, like it's not changed. You look at the, if you look at the history of television adverts involving China. Um, oh, and I published it in Joe McJournal, which is online available. Blah, 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 and I called it from chop suey to chop sake. The construction of Chineseness in British television adverts, and it just shows the extent to which we think these things are sort of in the past and somewhere else, but they're still very much, um, still very much here and now, today. And the thing with Orientalism is, especially when it's uh, around representations of of East Asian, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, uh, Philippine, and so on, is that it's, there's often, there are often subtle forms of, of racism involved there that, that are not big, writ large, you know, the way that um, um, of other forms of cross-cultural representation in shite can be, can be perceived as racist. The, 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 the representation of Chinese stuff in Britain still, it goes under the radar even when it's really, um, really, really problematic. So, I think this is my last slide, I can't remember. Um, oh no, I wanted to, so we've got five minutes, great. So I wanted to um, segue into the theme of next week, which is issues in post-colonialism, and I wanted to look at this, which is from a television um, series called Goodness Gracious Me, which was on the TV maybe 10, maybe 15 years ago max, I think. Um, British comedy show, and it raises a lot of very interesting issues to finish off with. And again, upon this meeting of the Indian Broadcasting Corporation Board, I've invited you all down here today to introduce you to our new head of ethnic minority programming, Mr. John Britt. <laughs> John will be making sure that our representation of uh, English people will be tickety boo. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's right. And uh, I've got a few suggestions. Well, I'm glad to hear that you've settled in all right. I call this Hang on, hang on, hang on. I'm actually finished. Uh, here we go. <laughs> now, I really do feel that the British community in India is totally underrepresented in the media here. Uh, now, hang on a minute. I have to disagree, right? You've got that weekly magazine program. What's it called? Uh, Network West. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I saw a brilliant item on last week's show, uh, The Morris Dancers of a Mana. Oh, yeah. <laughs> with traditional British brass band music. <laughs> <laughs> it was up at 6 o'clock on a Sunday morning. Why do they get up so early? Huh? Walk the dog, I think. <laughs> <laughs> In any case, we're not all Morris dancers, you know. That's just a stereotype. And why is it, whenever we see a Brit on TV, he's either a tourist or a diplomat? Why can't we play doctors? Uh, uh, or, I don't know, shopkeepers. <laughs> Come on, I mean, when was the last time you saw a white doctor? <laughs> you were not those two characters in the long-running soap opera West Enders. Oh, wow. <laughs> Rita, the baby crying! Satan, stop sleeping with my sister! <laughs> do, 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 do. Oh. A season of English film. Oh, oh, oh. I've got to ask you, has anybody actually seen an English film? Eh? No. I mean, what are they all about? Eh? Uh, I saw one once. Remains of the day. <laughs> Couldn't believe it. Right? Only two hours long. Right? No dancing. <laughs> well, they can't, can they? <laughs> British comedy show. <laughs> British comedy? Are they funny? <laughs> well, the accent's quite funny. Uh, oh. that's, that's right, that's right. You say anything in an English accent is bound to get along. <laughs> totally quite right. <laughs> We're tired of being marginalised and exploited and reduced to farcical stereotypes. Okay? Now we want change, and we want it now! Okay, John. I think I have a proposal that will satisfy us all. <coughs> well, that's, that's great. 
I propose we cut your budget by 50%, lay off three quarters of your staff, and relocate the ethnic minority unit to just outside Tilanda. <laughs> Now, hang on a second. And we will also be extending your contract for life. That sounds perfect. Welcome to Renew. Have a So, lots of issues there. Uh, I'll leave it at that. We'll pick, we'll pick this up next week. Um, see you Friday.